So why all the confusion? Why are these poor undergraduates being taught all these different things in textbooks? Every website you go to has a different answer. Every coach you talk to seems to disagree or argue, and, and every potential expert says they know something different. Well, I think if we go over these next couple of slides, you're going to understand why the confusion exists, and you'll be able to rest easy by, with knowing the fact there is no confusion. Okay, so let's dive into this just a little bit. Well, what we do know is, based on our different uh, typing methods, if you look at the studies that have used either histochemistry or homogenous gels, you're going to find arguing back and forth about whether or not fiber types change with training. However, every single study ever done that's used single fiber gel electrophoresis, which allows you to actually accurately identify and type those hybrids, every single one of those studies is in agreement. So if you wonder why the confusion, it simply comes down to a methodology issue. Look back at your textbook. Look back at the blog you read, or whatever you read that said there was some confusion about this. I guarantee you, if you read the papers they're citing, they use either histochemistry or gel hom homogenates, or worse yet, they compared the results from the two. And you know what? I don't blame you for this, by the way. Let me make sure that that's clear, because it's not fair. In fact, even in a recent published literature review, the authors wrote a little passage that made me pull my freaking hair out. In fact, it's the reason why I made this talk. Right, let, me, let me read this verbatim so that I don't misquote them. Ready? Quote. Findings opposing alterations in fiber type do exist. Thus, the contention that exercise elicits a shift in fiber type remains unsubstantiated, at least in part. Unquote. No, it's not. In fact, if you look at this study, and I'm not naming the authors on purpose here, uh, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. In fact, I know several of them, and they're, and they're fantastic people and researchers. But this is a real problem in science. How did this get through? None of their studies at all, not a single one of their studies, used the single fiber method, even though at the time, two or three dozen papers had been published using that methodology. In fact, the majority of their studies were over 20 years old. I can't believe that this got through. So I don't blame you as a researcher. I don't blame you as a student. I don't blame you as someone who's not in this field at all, but just is geeking out right now. How could you not be possibly confused when only a few people in the world understand what's going on here? All right, so we need to set a higher standard there. If you look at the basic results, whether you're using histochemistry or, or gels, and you compare that to the single fiber stuff, I want to set you up so that you understand a basic fiber type profile. So most people in most muscles are, are uh, in the VL, I should say, the vastus lateralis. If you use either gel or histo, you'd have something like 50% of your fibers type 1, 30% type 2A, and 20% type 2X. It'd probably be reported as type 2B, but you now know that it's 2X, right? Gotcha, right? If you look at the gels, we see something that which is very similar, right? 40%. Uh, the single fiber gels, 40% type 1, which is close to 50% here, about 40% 2A, which is close, about 20% uh, of hybrids combined, which means about 10% 1, 2A, and 10% 2A, 2X. And in fact, in these, look at that. Interesting. Now, you may have picked this up earlier, and I've been specifically avoiding it until now. If you did, good for you. You're clever, little devil. Okay, so we see a very different fiber type, pro fiber type profile in some aspects, but overall it looks pretty similar. And if you looked at the studies that have been done in here, what you're probably going to find in general is a conclusion that, okay, with exercise training, we don't see a change in the type 1s. We see an increase in 2As and a consummate decrease in 2Xs. In fact, I still this, see this being published in brand new textbook every year that, quote, if you do training, you decrease your 2Xs. I see this all the time with people that, and I bless their heart, I'm not blaming them, because this is really confusing. I'm sure I make similar mistakes when I talk about bone or nerve or things like that, because that's not my field. So, man, I'm really not blaming you at all. I'm really trying to help. But I see this all the time. People say, well, when you train, your 2Xs go away. You're referring to studies that are 30 years old. 
In fact, we see something totally different in all of the new studies. How can something go away when it doesn't exist? It's not clear yet, let me show you. All right. What you would see here in all of these studies is that we see changes up and down. Right? All of your fiber types change with training when we have this specificity in typing. So why the discrepancy? Let's take a look. A couple of really clever studies should help us answer this question. So what these two studies did is they took individual muscle fibers and they cut them down the middle and split them. One half of the fiber came over here and got analyzed for its fiber type via histochemistry. The other half of the identical muscle fiber was cut and put through our single fiber electrophoresis process. So what, they able, what the researchers were able to do then is come back and say, okay, this exact muscle fiber when typed with histochemistry was this, and when typed with single fiber electrophoresis was this. In other words, are the two methods valid? Are they telling us the same information or not? Well, what they saw is, okay, when we typed all of the fibers in the study using the histochemistry method, we got about 50% of the fibers were type 1s, about 25 were 2A or something like that, more, maybe more like 30%, and then 20% was type 2X, which is very similar to the distribution I showed you a second ago, right? Well, that is what we would predict. But the exact same fibers typed the other method came out to be more like this. Something more like 25% type 1, ooh, 10 to 20% 1, 2A, maybe 20% 2A, 30 or 35% 2A, 2X, and almost none were pure 2Xs. So here's what you could identify or infer from this. What happens is a major number of the fibers typed with histochemistry are actually hybrid fibers misclassified. Remember histo? It's black, white, and then gray, grayish, gray, -er -er. Well, you have to take some of those grays and say this is a mm, type one. This is a lightly, this is an opaque, an eggshell white, if you will. We'll call it a white. Well, now what we see is when we increase the fidelity or accuracy of our measure, we say, no, 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 that's not a white, that's a one, two, A. Ah, interesting. This does two important very important things. Number one, why is it we can't find that fiber types are changing with training? Which of our fiber types were the ones that changed the most with training? The hybrids, right? Well, if I have a fiber, we'll call it a type one, and it is a one, two, hey, one, two, a, meaning I'm untrained, right? It should be a one, two, a. If I start training, that should convert into being a pure two or a pure type one based on what I've, I've just described, right? But if my pre-measurement before my training study is done and I mistype that one, two way as a type one, then I go and do my endurance training. It's now being converted into a type one, but I've already typed it as a type one. So it's a one before the study and it's a one after the study. No change. When in actuality, it did change. All right, so I think right here, this is a great example or a great explanation of why all those early studies that used histochemistry came up with these mixed conclusions or most specifically said, hey, ones don't change. Well, that's because so many people have so many one, two A's and so many of them were being misclassified as a pure one or a pure two A. Of course, you don't see any change. We see that being also extremely evident with the two A, two X's. Remember how a slide ago I told you with histochemistry, we generally say that your two X's go away with training. What we now know is those two X's are actually two A two X's that are mistyped. And what happens to two A two X's when you start training? They go away, right? They differentiate into becoming probably pure two A's. So this right here explains very clearly both of our initial problems. Why is it these things are arguing? Why are we not seeing a change? And then all of a sudden we started seeing a change when we switched to more accurate methodologies. And two, why is it that they report, well, some of the reports say that you go down in your two X's, but some of them show no two X's. This is why the confusion exists. If you just pay attention to the methodology, you find this answer. And it also brings up something else very, very interesting. Why is it we don't see many of these pure two X's? Hmm. Well, in fact, what's actually happening here, if we could summarize is several studies 
across several labs across the world have shown that actually less than one out of every 1,000 fibers are a pure 2X. In fact, in my laboratory, we have typed several thousand fibers and I found only a small handful of pure 2Xs. We never see them. They're just not available in normal human physiology other than a few exceptions. We have seen some older individuals that are say maybe two or three percent two X, maybe up to five percent, but not much more than that. And your young healthy populations, almost never. In fact, here's where stuff got really crazy. Yeah. If we look at a normal distribution, like we've been saying, using our single fiber electrophoresis, maybe 40, 50 percent type one, 20, 30, 40 percent two A, and then maybe 10, 15, 20 percent total hybrids. I'm just making these numbers up. Well, I got to be a part of, several years ago, a really interesting study that took a muscle biopsy of a world champion sprinter. This is a world record holder in the uh, 60, I think, and 110 meter hurdles. Well, for the most part, like I said, less than 1.1, actually 0.1% of all fibers are pure 2X in our normal population. Well, this particular sprinter was actually sort of like what we would expect. He had less, he had very few numbers of pure type ones, which is very normal. He had a lot of these two ways, not too many hybrids. We had taken this biopsy, or sorry, we had the biopsy had been done um, several years after the athlete was over competing, so he wasn't necessarily super trained. Um, it probably moderately at best, so he did have a few of these hybrids, but it was maybe just a few years after his his world record performances. But what shocked us was that. Right. This particular athlete had 24% pure 2X fibers. To my knowledge, not another athlete or a person on the planet, a uh, healthy person I should say, has had that many 2Xs. So quite literally, he was an X-Man. Get it? And what's particularly interesting about this is if we look back to the problems I talked about earlier, what are the type of athletes that were missing from this fiber type equation? We've done excessive, extensive research on your endurance athletes, but we have no information on anaerobic athletes and absolutely none on fast athletes. And if we consider what it means to be a fast twitch fiber, that quite literally is speed, right? The difference between a fast twitch and slow twitch is speed of twitch. It's not even necessarily size, which we'll talk about in a second, or power. It's speed. So to me, it makes the most sense to say, well, you want to see people on the other end of the speed spectrum. You've already typed the slowest people. Why not tie up the fastest people? Hasn't been done yet. Right. So I always get this follow-up question here at this point is, okay, well, if no one ever has these pure two X's, what's the point of them? I, I honestly don't know. We could speculate a few reasons why we think they exist because we only see them in really two populations, this crazy world record holder sprinter and then people that have actually had their spine or other major issues where a muscle has been de-innervated for decades, or years at least. Some of these folks have 60, 70% two axes. What most people think is that it's a little bit more metabolically efficient to have a fast twitch fiber. It's too much energy to keep these slow twitch fibers that are packed with mitochondria and need a lot of um, metabolism, need a lot of oxygen around to stay, to stay uh, surviving. And so when the fiber is, is about to die, it maybe transitions its way from slow to fast all the way down to 2x. So 2x could be a sign of dying. And this is also why if you do have marginal amounts of 2x, if you do engage in any activity, uh, they go away. The case with this particular world sprinter, though, I don't know. What's Usain Bolt or Justin Gatlin look like? I don't know. Okay, so to summarize everything, our final points here before we hit some final conclusions. Why did all the confusion exist here? It simply came down to a lack of sensitive sensitivity in the fiber typing methods. Once we cleared that up, we seem to have no more confusion. The other major cause of confusion was that misclassification of fibers, specifically the misclassification of the 1-2A and 2A-2X hybrids and the misclassification of those pure 2X fibers. As we wrap up this final, uh, this talk, I wanted to end on a little bit of a positive note and to talk about the future a little bit. And this is what I'll actually call my call for action. The reason we have so many problems in this area is because people aren't interested in enough of these questions. Now, what I mean is people are interested, but they're not the right people 
are interested. So what ends up happening is we have a ton of people out there, and, and I don't even know who's listening, but probably some of you are really interested in, say, the sport performance aspect of muscle physiology. So perhaps you're a coach, you could talk all day about different training systems and how one's a little bit better for power production, and one's better for hypertrophy or something. And then on the other end of this continuum, we have people that are excellent muscle scientists, right? So they could take an isolated cell from a Petri dish, or they could take a fiber from an animal, and they could run a bunch of really impressive and complicated cellular and molecular analyses. But what we don't have is anybody in the middle. We don't have any people like, like you see my four students here who know the practical side. They, they have their CSCS certification. They are themselves athletes. They work directly with athletes, but then they also work in the laboratories. And I think the reason for that is, is the people that are coaches get too intimidated by this science and the sophistication. And then the people that are, that are scientists they don't have an appreciation for the application or never really train, don't really work out, and don't really understand it or care. Well, I want to break both of those things because, I, in fact, I know that this stuff, although it sounds complicated and sophisticated, you can do it too. Right? You see these people here, all my four students that are running experiments. Not a single one of them had a chemistry class before they came into my laboratory. They're all graduate students. They came from different backgrounds. Uh, one of them's a, a yogi. One of them came from another country. Some of them have came from different fields entirely. Athletic training, uh, biology, you name it. Right? We can teach you anything you need to. It's, in fact, it's not that complicated. Most people come into our lab and they think like, wow, this is actually not that much more difficult than baking a pie, making a cake. It's not that complicated. So those of you that are maybe hedging yourself toward the practitioner side, but you think this stuff is really fascinating and interesting, and you're an undergraduate or, or a high schooler or even in, in graduate school, don't sell yourself short. Right? I barely had a three-point GPA as an undergrad, and I'm the director of the Biochemistry and Molecular Exercise Physiology Laboratory. Right? I never took organic chemistry. I, I didn't take biochemistry until I was a, a PhD student, and I have a PhD in bioenergetics. Right? So I don't want to portray any false sense of this is too complicated. Oh my God, this is so sophisticated. Well, we try to make it complicated, but it's fun and any of you can do it. So if you are at all inclined, I, I really think we need more people that understand the practical side to get into it. Right, we just don't have many people. So that's my call to action. And if I can help you anyway, uh, along the way, please let me know. I, I really love it when we get people that really understand performance in this field of cellular and molecular biology. To summarize our entire talk now that I've got off of that soapbox, right? we have this initial question at the very beginning. right? We have these black fibers and we've got these white fibers and these slow twitch and fast twitch. And we wanted to know, can they change with training? Well, I hope we've answered the question that absolutely they can. Doesn't mean they will, but we certainly can. And it can happen in normal situations. We also have identified that our fibers could probably be somewhere in the middle. So we've got black, white, and gray, and then a bunch of things. And we also need to understand that your muscle is tremendously plastic. So depending on what you've heard, a lot of people will say things like, hey, the first four to six to eight weeks of any training program, all of the, the adaptations are neurological. Well, that's not true at all. Certainly a lot of the adaptations are neurological, but don't you give all that credit to the stupid nervous system. Muscle has some stuff too. Muscle is adapt adapting. Everything you do matters. Every sleep, recovery, training, nutrition choice you make influences the way muscle adapts. I would argue it is the most plastic, most adaptable system in your entire body. We've picked up changes in fiber types in tremendously short durations. Right? So give muscle some credit and realize that everything you do matters. It sees it and it changes because of it. We started off four or five decades ago with all these different fiber types. And as I mentioned hours ago, Right. In 1971, they were already saying things like, you know what, this is really just a big continuum. Right. We've got slow and fast and everything's somewhere in the middle. And in fact, we'll go back to a quote that I told you earlier I loved and I still love. Fiber types are simply too dynamic and flexible. Right. So fiber typing is clearly important. But we do need to recognize that muscle function goes far beyond simply fiber type. Uh, in fact, there are very famous people in this field that study muscle function at a very high level, and they'll say things like fiber type doesn't matter. Well, I think I've made my case now 
that it does matter. But I will grant them, it's not everything. I can't predict 100% of your vertical jump ability, your max deadlift, your one mile sprint time, simply based on your fiber type. It's an important consideration, but there are other things, and we're not gonna get into them now, but this is one quick example. We have to realize that single fiber function changes. What I mean by that is, I'll take an individual muscle fiber, and we'll call it a fast and a slow one like we've been doing since the very beginning. Well, those fibers produce a certain amount of power or force per contraction, but that force and power can change over time. Just like at the whole muscle level, right? You know it's possible to get stronger and more powerful without necessarily adding any more muscle mass, right? Well, if I asked you why does that happen or how is that possible, you would all say, well, it's neurological. Well, it is in part, but what we know is the contractile ability of the fibers changes independent of fiber type change and size. So, if, for example, if we had a fast twitch fiber here and a slow twitch fiber there, and they produced some random amount of power, after some sort of training, and it doesn't matter, I'm just making arbitrary units here, this is not a particular study, I'm just showing you a concept. After, say, 8, 10, 12 weeks of, study, of, of training, the amount of power each one of those individual fibers can produce goes up. So independent of the slow turning into a fast, its single fiber function can improve. Right? We're just starting to explore this area. There's been some great work done in the past, but we need a lot more, and we need to expand our horizons in terms of what we're looking at. Right? So some other considerations that, that would play into whole muscle function are things like metabolic capacity. We started off our talk talking about how the original way to differentiate fiber types was enzymatic profiles. Well, we need to explore that area some more. That uh, certainly can play a role in, in, in whole muscle function. The percent of the area occupied, like we mentioned, I don't necessarily know that performance is more or less dictated by distribution or percent area occupied. Contractile fiber function, like we just mentioned, um, and other things like that are beyond muscle themselves. Things like the extracellular matrix. This would be uh, sort of the connective tissue around your fibers, muscle, how that works into a tendon, and, and the, the force production or transfer abilities of the tendon and collagen. Bone, penation angle, biomechanics, neurological considerations, all of that functions, and we haven't even got into sports psychology, motivation, uh, or, or things like that. So uh, human performance is extremely complex. Um, this, this does explain a portion of it, and what obviously I think a very interesting portion of it, um, but I am well aware and, and happy to acknowledge that it's not everything. On that note, what we generally recognize is a couple of things. In general, your fast twitch fibers, different than most people think, are actually not bigger than your slow twitch fibers. In fact, they're simply faster. So uh, my colleague Dr. Bagley is working on this and it will probably honestly take us years before we can publish this, so you can rake me over the coals now if you want. But we generally don't see the fibers being different per fiber type per size. What we see different is the contractile velocity, unless you're specifically trained. So someone who does a lot of strength training or resistance exercise, there probably is some fiber type specific hypertrophy happening there. Their fast twitch fibers probably will be bigger than their slow twitch. But we've seen that on the other end of the spectrum as well. High level endurance athletes or just highly trained uh, someone who's done a lot of endurance training, their slow twitch fibers are probably bigger than their fast twitch fibers. Again, I know I'm telling you we don't have the proof now. Um, we have the numbers in the lab. It's, just, it's literally going to take us years to get that stuff out. But trust me when I say that. All right. Um, but perhaps this is why we really didn't see any of these differences in those 2x until, we, until that, that world-class sprinter was biopsied um, from that one lab. So uh, just stuff to consider in the future. Um, Fiber types probably explain fast more than anything. Of course, we know that power is a function of speed, right? The power is force times velocity. So perhaps this is why we see that. And if we studied more people that were further down the, the fast spectrum, perhaps we understand more about muscle function. We would know these things. In case you are wondering, I brought this up several times and I will give you some numbers. Uh, the speed is different. A lot different. In fact, that's the most significant difference between the fiber types is their speed of contraction. Because that is a part of power, power is different as well, but probably not as different as the speed. Uh, and, and strength, not so much either. 
Uh, what we generally say is your, your type 2As are somewhere about two to five times as fast as your type 1s with your 2Xs when we can find them, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 times faster than your type 1s. It's really important for me that we go back all the way to the beginning to wrap up this massive video. We have to recognize our own limitations, our own faults and mistakes. As paramount and unbelievably as impressive as Huxley and Huxley's 1954 description of the sliding bit film theory was, we are only now starting to realize, you know what, maybe they're actually a little bit wrong. But that's not to demean them or insult them. What they, this is arguably one of the greatest discoveries of muscle function in, in human history. But it's not perfect. And I expect you to understand the same thing about the talk I just gave about muscle fiber types. I told you about as much information as, as I know on muscle fiber types, but I fully recognize I'm sure some of that's wrong. There might be some folks out there right now that have done studies that are in this field that say actually we're finding something different or we disagree with this point, and I would love to hear it. Uh, I promise you something in that talk I just gave is very wrong. Not only probably right now, but certainly 10, 20, 30 years from now, all this talk will be completely different. So the best way I can describe this with this part of physiology or really any aspect of physiology or nutrition for that matter is this is as we understand it now. This is our best and most current information. When we learn more stuff, we'll change. All right, so I have to, to thank Dr. Jimmy Bagley for this. Um, his, muscle, his website, uh, musclephyslab.com, is phenomenal, and he's helped me so much over the years. He's a real expert. I would really encourage, if you like single fiber function, if you like muscle physiology like this, to check out his lab and his social media at Dr. Jimmy Bagley, because uh, he's a real true expert and a pioneer in this field. But also to recognize that, you know, perhaps if anything, maybe I got 80% of this thing wrong. Um, well, probably not, but surely something's wrong in this. Maybe, though, I entertained you. Hopefully, at least I told a fun enough story that inspired you to learn this field, and you'll spend hundreds and thousands of hours diving into this stuff, and you can come back in, in a month or a year from now and tell me what I missed, what I did wrong. Ultimately, that's the goal of doing all these things. I appreciate you sticking around for this whole time. Hope you had fun. Uh, please share around and, and let me know what I can do to help. Peace and love, y'all.